All right, normally this one goes. <laughs> Give me one second, just until I can go live on Instagram. Always takes a delay here. I think it's working, yay. Okay, um, hi everyone. <laughs> so this is Dr. Isabel Amig, your friendly rheumatologist who had a problem with her computer last time. And so we're doing this, we're doing a take two on drug-induced lupus. Um, yeah, I don't know uh, what to tell you. I will say that rebooting the computer was uh, ultimately what worked. And um, I feel silly for not thinking of it earlier. The truth though is that I don't usually reboot my patient. So um, maybe that's why I don't think of that option <laughs> as something that's possible. Um, but yeah, so the computer is finally working. Hopefully you have sound, you have video, um, and hopefully this is gonna be a great live. Um, so we are talking today about drug-induced lupus, and uh, it's a question that came uh, from one of the followers of Rheumatology 101 um, uh, on YouTube. So thank you so much for asking this question. And I'm going to tie in with what is antihistone, because that was one of the questions uh, that, uh, that you also asked. I think it's uh, Rock by the Creek. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so, you know, maybe presenting you a little bit of a case at first uh, so that you understand when we are thinking about uh, uh, drug-induced lupus. And, and really, what you have to understand is that uh, when we think barefoot by the creek, that's what it is, hi. Um, so when, when we are, um, uh, when we're, you know, dealing with a patient with something that looks autoimmune. Um, so it might be a rash, it might be joint pain that's inflammatory, it might be uh, shortness of breath, uh, fluid in the lung, fluid around the heart. Uh, and then basically when we're thinking, okay, can, can this be lupus? Um, and I'm going to refer you guys to uh, uh, the previous uh, lives that I've done and previous videos that I've done on lupus. And we can definitely talk about that later on. But you're right, like, so we're thinking lupus. And then it really is the role of uh, the physician to really, like, figure out why someone has what they have. And so um, I personally always think that uh, it's my fault. I mean, I'm not saying mine, mine, but my fault as the medical body, right? Um, so we are always trying to put our patients uh, back into balance. And by doing so, sometimes we can create an imbalance. Maybe it's an imbalance from another condition or things like that. And so that's why we have to take time to really like uh, make sure that everything we're doing is uh, proper. Uh, so let me tell you maybe the last case of uh, drug-induced lupus that I had. Uh, it was a patient that was in her 60s which, uh, by the way, drug uh, new onset uh, lupus is pretty rare after menopause. So that was already like something that ticked into the mind. And uh, she came in, she had, uh, she developed uh, over the course of a couple of months, some inflammatory joint pain. So pain that's worse in the morning, associated with morning stiffness of more than 30 minutes. And um, she had a little bit of swelling, but most importantly, her pain was worse in the morning, okay? Uh, that's, that's really important because at 60, uh, at 60 and over, uh, uh, you can have quite a bit of pain because of osteoarthritis, you know, the wear and tear that our grandma and great grandma have had. Uh, but usually that pain is worse at the end of the day or after they've done a lot. And so this patient had this inflammatory arthritis, so really a good reason to send her to a rheumatologist. And in addition, uh, she had uh, some shortness of breath, and what we found is that she had pleural effusion. So it's when your lungs, uh, I mean, really the sac that surrounds your lung um, is filled with fluid and restricts your ability to take deep breath, right? And so you are feeling short of breath. So she had this, and then, so basically, because of that, we were like, okay, is there possibility that, you know, can this be rheumatoid arthritis? Because that's the age, like, that's one of the age group. Can this be uh, lupus? Uh, and uh, and then the, the, the really important question was, like, what are the medications you're on? Um, have you been infected recently? Have you had any infection recently? And things like that. And uh, what... Uh, 
what turned out is that she had a history of hypertension and that hypertension had been treated for a very long time um, by hydralazine. So uh, the reason I'm sharing this is that very often our patients think, oh, I've been on this for so long. Um, that is probably not, uh, you know, that, that's not the culprit. So yeah, no, I've been on my medication for over two years, never changed, nothing has changed. In fact, I don't even know the name of my medicine because I take it every morning and I don't, I, I, I forget. And then you have, as a rheumatologist, to really like follow up, like what medications is this? Like maybe you have to call the pharmacy to ask them what medication this patient is taking. Okay. And uh, so we, you know, after looking at those symptoms, so I repeat for those who just came on, inflammatory arthritis uh, and uh, fluid around the heart, uh, lungs. Uh, then you have to double check everything. So is there a protein that's leaking in the urine? So that's proteinuria. Is there blood in the urine? That's a, a hematuria. Uh, and is there, you know, active sediments? That's something that uh, the nephrologists or, you know, uh, pathologists are going to look under the microscope. And um, you also have to make sure, because she has fluid around the lungs, you have to make sure she doesn't have fluid around the heart as well. So I ordered an echo to make sure that there was no fluid around the heart. And then we do blood work. So we do blood work to make sure that this is not rheumatoid arthritis. We do blood work to make sure this is not lupus. And then you do know, other blood work. Like, is there, you know, uh, other reasons that you may be thinking that this is uh, um, an autoimmune disorder? And um, she had a positive ANA. Uh, so that, you know, by itself is, okay, it's this lupus. But then the really interesting thing is that she had a positive anti-histone as well. And I think that that's super important as well. She had a positive DSDNA. Uh, and I think her complements of C3, C4, I don't remember, but I don't think they were abnormal, okay? Uh, so she has a diagnosis of lupus because she fits the criteria and it makes, you know, sense. But in this case, I think that that's really important to first one realize that the antihistone was ordered because we saw that she was on hydralisin. And I don't think we would have ordered it otherwise. It's not, I don't order antihistone on everyone just because um, there, there's no really a reason to order antihistone on everyone. Um, if uh, there's someone that has no medication or medications that do not cause uh, a, a drug in your snoopers, okay? Uh, so that's actually uh, quite interesting. And so uh, basically we made a diagnosis of drug-induced lupus. So I think, you know, in her case, uh, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to remove the hydralazine and I'm going to wait and see how she does. Because uh, the truth is that the damage has already been done. Uh, uh, I mean, there can be further damage, of course, and you are preventing that. And it's, you know, when there's damage, that doesn't mean you cannot reboot the system. <laughs> no, go back because our bodies are way better than a computer and they can heal, unlike a computer that needs a human uh, to fix it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so basically, in her case, we started her on prednisone, we put her on uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, so plaquenil. And uh, we put a little bit of, yeah, we put a little bit of prenison just because of that uh, pleural effusion. We looked how she was doing. And then uh, um, uh, we actually added uh, a Benista until she did very well. And uh, we started backing off from everything, basically. Okay. And the goal for those drug induced lupus is once they are in remission, because they are not, because you're removed the culprit, you can actually also remove all of the medicine that you've put because it was drug-induced lupus. But at the beginning, they need uh, they need medication. You cannot leave someone that has shortness of breath without any medication thinking, oh, I'm removing the culprit, so it's going to go away. So now let's talk about what really drug-induced lupus is uh, because it's not completely understood. Uh, number one, what causes that? So there are some medications that can lead to what we call drug-induced lupus. And there are many ones, okay? Uh, many types of drug-induced lupus. Um, when there is the lupus word into this uh, drug-induced lupus, because uh, it is really a lupus, right? As we saw with this patient, she had joint pain, that's inflammatory, she had pleural infusion. Um, and... 
and she had the antibodies. What's interesting is that uh, there are some medications that we know can cause, cause drug-induced lupus, and we know that very often drug-induced lupus has this positive anti we do not know, or at least to my knowledge, and I was like trying to look on the literature and I, I really couldn't find that. We do not know if the antihistone causes harm or if the antihistone is just a marker that you have a uh, drug induced lupus. So uh, just a little, uh, a little nuance here. You can have antihistone and not have drug-induced lupus. Okay, so that's important. So for example, if you have lupus and someone has checked your antihistone, even though you are on no medication, you've been on no medication before, uh, we're not going to call this drug-induced lupus. We're going to call it lupus, but uh, you do have an antihistone. Okay, uh, so that was the little nuance, just so that you understand why some patients do have an antihistone I don't usually check it in patients who don't have a reason to have drug-induced lupus. And then some patients can have drug-induced lupus without the antihistone. So for example, in my practice in rheumatology, I use a lot of anti-TNF, such as Humira, Remicade, uh, Infliximab, uh, Umbrel. And we know those uh, TNF inhibitor can cause uh, lupus. So that's actually quite interesting, right? So you have a patient that's doing super well from the rheumatoid arthritis perspective, thanks to, let's say, Humira or, you know, Infliximab, it doesn't matter, a TNF inhibitor. And then they come back with a new onset of joint pain and a rash. And you're like, what's going on here? And you've got to think, is this possibly a drug-induced lupus from my TNF inhibitor? And the way you're going to uh, look at this is that you have checked uh, the DSDNA and the ANA, so those are serologies, before you started the patients on a TNF inhibitor, and you follow that and see if potentially this is what's happening. You can also check uh, a skin, like the skin, if they have a skin involvement, you can actually look and do a little biopsy to check for lupus, and uh, you're looking at, you know, other um, symptoms of lupus and seeing if it all fits. When I tell you rheumatology is an art, it is an art, and that's why it's such an exciting field, right? Um, you always have to think. And so uh, to come back, you have so TNF inhibitor that can cause, especially in my word, uh, drug and lupus, and they don't have antihistone. You can have antihistone without having drug and lupus, but just lupus. And then you have some drugs, and usually they are cardiac, uh, cardiologic drugs. So hydrazine, uh, uh, some, you know, cardiac uh, antiarrhythmic and things like that, antihypertensive, uh, those can cause drug-induced lupus. And it can come, you know, after two years. It doesn't have to come right away. Um, and so the question about is the antihistone a marker or a cause of the drug-induced lupus, I think to me, as a rheumatologist, as a clinician, I don't think it is as important as really like just being very clear of what the patient has, how do they present and how do we treat them, like, right? So the patient that I showed you, uh, I, I talked to you about at the beginning when I was saying like they had inflammatory arthritis and pleural effusion, the pleural effusion needs uh, uh, treatment uh, with steroids at first, right? Whereas if it was just joint pain, we could probably just do plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, okay? And so that, to me, that's why I don't stop at just the antibodies. I don't stop just as like, oh, why or what is like, we are really like looking at the patients and it's full and how are they presenting? What's going on? Is there a reason why they may have developed this? And can we go to the root cause of their lupus. And in this case, the root cause is the drug-induced lupus, okay? Uh, I think, you know, uh, basically, we know that there's a lot of those cardiologic uh, drugs that can cause uh, drug-induced uh, lupus. We know that the antihistone is a marker, usually, of drug-induced lupus. I think what I want to share here is to be a little bit more open-minded and realize that 
it's too easy and it's not it doesn't reflect life basically to say oh this is drug induced lupus so the only problem is the drug you have to also realize that there's probably an autoimmune component in that patient that they develop a drug induced lupus and for example we know that a lot of patients that are put on TNF inhibitor will develop a positive DNA and a DSDNA, but the vast majority of them will not develop lupus. Okay, so that's actually really important to realize. And so I think knowing what the family history is, do they have any patients with lupus in the around them? That has to make you think, okay. If there is, you know, family history of lupus, maybe I don't want to give TNF inhibitor to this patient and I would rather another biologic. Um, okay, I've been over 15 minutes. Hopefully this is good. If you're watching this on replay, put the hashtag. Um, it's, you know, hopefully this has helped you. Uh, we will, you know, talk about another topic next week. And uh, I just want to say thank you for everyone that's tuning in. I see seen Join the Dog. Uh, Jorge Ruiz, Lisa Poche, Nicole Pedersen, and uh, Rida. Um, again, thank you so much for joining, and I will see you next week. This time my computer is working, guys. I mean, the software, that's really what the problem was. And have a wonderful uh, week. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Barefoot. Bye-bye.